Uh, uh, Professor Gavison already, already knows how hard it is to cut out the discussion just as it started, but I have to uh, get the, our next uh, participant, Dr. Gaz, uh, Gad, to the, to the stage. Let me introduce Azar Gad. Uh, he is um, the Ezra Weizmann Professor of National Security and uh, the head of the department at uh, Tel Aviv University. Not head of department, Former. see, I already Former. formally okay, the chairman, sorry. okay, um, let me correct that. And uh, he's, uh, his research focuses on military history and strategy. Let me just uh, pick out two publications. One is Nations, the Long History and Deep Roots of Political Ethnicity and Nationalism. And the other one, which is uh, sort of the backdrop for our uh, d discussion today is victorious and vulnerable why democracy won in the 20th century and how it is still imperiled. Now you uh, rephrase that a little bit um, in, uh, in the question on what does it augur for the future. So we're yeah. very excited to hear Thank about you. that. Thank you. I'm just, Please. You know, I cannot, Take I cannot it. restrain myself, so I, <laughs> I must ask the previous uh, speaker what, what is the right that uh, yeah. What is, what is, what is, just as you know. So, I ask it, by what right you, you prevent this uh, proverbial African from living in your house? What is the moral right that, give, that you have to prevent him from actually living in your house rather than in your country? Okay, but uh, we shall leave this behind. That's, uh, so we'll move to uh, our subject. Is, and, and so uh, democracy, democracy emerged victorious from all of the great power struggles of the 20th century defeating youth, uh, authoritarianism, fascism, and, com and communism alike. And what accounts for this decisive outcome, and what does it tell us about the shape of the 21st century? These are the questions that I'll, be, I'll discuss here. As it happens, I've already addressed this question, and the return of the author authoritarian capitalist great powers a decade ago, before the economic crisis, the crisis of Europe, and the so-called democratic recession. So why did democracy win in the 20th century? It has been tempting to look for the roots of its victory in, its special trades, in the special trades of liberal democracy. It has long been believed that liberalism and democracy were inextricably intertwined with the process of modernization. According to, the, to this view, re-amplified by Francis Fukuyama, industrialization, urbanization, the rise of the middle class, the spread of education, an ever greater affluence fostered and in turn depended upon a free society. There is an effect only one way, one sustainable way uh, to modernity which confers an air of inevitability on the past as well as on the, pre uh, as well as on the future and gives much cause for optimism. There are two main interrelated perspectives on this process, that of great power politics and that of internal development. I begin with the former, with great power of conflict and war. I argue that there were very different reasons for the defeat of the communist as opposed to the capitalist authoritarian and totalitarian challenges. The communist great powers, the Soviet Union and China, even though they were potentially larger than the democracies, ultimately lost because they, they proved to be economically inefficient. It was the system that failed. Together, the Soviet Union and China were larger and therefore had the potential to be more powerful than the democratic capitalist camp. However, both communist China and the Soviet Union ultimately found the system inefficient and they each voluntarily began to dismantle it, uh, independent of each other, around 1980. On the other hand, the capitalist non-democratic great powers were defeated not because of inefficiency. Germany was at least as advanced as arrivals in both world wars, and Japan exhibited the fastest growth rate between 1913 and 1939. The problem was that they happened to be too small. Both Germany and Japan were middle-class, middle-sized countries with a limited resource and manpower base. 
unable to contend with the giants, most notably with the continent-sized US, they were crushed under the weight of the coalition assembled against them. The, re the reason for their fall was therefore largely contingent. Throughout the 20th century, the United States' power consistently surpassed that of the next strongest states combined, and this decisively tilted the global balance of power in favor of the democracies. If any factor gave the liberal democracies the edge, it was above all the actual existence of the United <coughs> States and its continental size rather than any inherent advantage of liberal democracy. The United States has been the butt of every criticism, some more justified than others. Yet it has not been fully recognized that only because the 20th century was the American century that it was also the century of democratic victories. Put differently, if it were not for the existence of the United States, the liberal democracies would most likely have lost the great struggles of the 20th century. As a start, Britain and France would have probably lost to Germany in either of the two world wars. This is a sobering thought, making the world created by the 20th century conflict appear much more contingent and tenuous than union theories of development and the view of history as progress would have us believe. In a very real sense, we might have had a very different and non-democratic 20th century, a very different world today, and a very different story to tell in the form of grand theories of development. History is written by the victors who tend to generalize and rationalize the reasons on the reasons for their success. I now turn to the domestic development argument. It is widely held that after crossing a certain threshold in terms of development, wealth per capita, education, urbanization, and so forth, societies tend to democratize. As we saw in East and Southeast Asia, Southern Europe, and Latin America. But again, I argue that this notion is an abstraction from a very particular set of, circumsta of circumstances that prevailed after 1945, which, with the consequences that the sample is skewed. This is so because all the, the post-1945 cases involved small countries which, after the defeat of Germany and Japan, could only choose between the communist and capitalist democratic camps. If they chose the latter, they were invariably exposed to the massive pressure of the hegemonic Western liberal democratic center, pressures which contributed decisively to the eventual democratization. Presently, Singapore is the only example of a truly developed economy that still maintains elements of a semi-authoritarian regime. But are Singapore-like great powers that prove resistance to the, e resistance to the influence of, of the liberal order possible? This question becomes highly relevant with the emergence of new non-democratic giants. These are these, uh, what we have today with China, first time mentioned here today. I mean, it, I think it's uh, apart from, you, from the West, no other region of the world was discussed today in the, in, the, um, in the discussion about the future of democracy. What we have today in China, and to a much lesser degree with Russia, is the giant in the system, previously held back by its inefficient communist economy, switching to a much more efficient and hence more powerful form of authoritarianism, thereby creating a new, historically unprecedented challenge, that of a non-democratic superpower, which is both big and capitalist. <coughs> Will China and Russia ultimately converge into the liberal democratic range? Or are they big enough to chart a different course and challenge the hegemonic model, creating a non-democratic but economically advanced and militarily powerful new second world? Naturally, all the old questions regarding the viability of a different course to modernity, other than the liberal democratic one, resurface. With respect to the economy, it is widely argued that the advanced stage of the information age requires an open and individualistic culture. However, semi-authoritarian semi Singapore and Chinese-ruled Hong Kong 
have a highly successful information economy. It is also contended that because of a lack of political accountability and transparency, China will increasingly suffer from the ill effects of chronic favoritism and corruption, much, is, much in evidence there today, as in most of the developing economy, you know, economy, uh, economies. However, as Ellen Greenspan, the former chairman of the US Federal Reserve Bank writes, Singapore is one of the, le of the least corrupt states in the world, as indeed was Imperial Germany and its Prussian predecessor. For Max Weber, Prussian German bureaucracy became paradigmatic, and it was indeed proverbial for its efficiency and clean hands. China is now in the middle of an efficient, high-profile anti-corruption campaign. How successful it will prove uh, is, uh, is an open question. Hong Kong, where large-scale pro-democratic demonstration erupted in, 19, in uh, uh, 2014, brings us to the, pol to the political argument. It is widely held that the economic and social development creates pressure for democratization that an authoritarian state structure will not be able to contain. Capitalism is based on the exercise of individual choice, and thus non-democratic capitalist regimes supposedly suffer from an intern internal contradiction that inclined them to implode. This argument appears very convincing until one remembers that capitalist democracy itself is a combination that has always been torn between the economic inequality generated by capitalism and democracy overwhelming egalitarian drive. This, this tension was so stark that socialists regarded it as an irreconcil irreconcilable contradiction that was certain to doom capitalist democracy and preordained socialism, economic democratization as the wave of the future. Some of the tensions has, have, have, uh, some of the tension has since been alleviated through the institution of the welfare state, but much of it remains. Thus, in real life, people regularly live with tensions and contradictions, and the question is which of these proved to be more significant and irreconcilable. Without ideological legitimacy and a guiding ethos, no regime can stand for long. China is still ruled by a communist party, which in reality is no longer communist. The party's raison d'etre and source of legitimacy since the beginning of, the of, of market reform has been successful economic modernization and the maintenance of social stability during that process. The party is insecure, highly pragmatic, and ready to adopt any measure that would sustain it in power and continue the process. Institutionally, the regime is trying to broaden its base, co-opt the business elite into the party, and democratize the party itself. It is experimenting with various forms of popular participation, including village and some town elections, and public op opinion surveys. Thank you. The internet is widely utilized in these experiments, as well as being heavily and quite effectively censored. Analysts have dubbed these experiments deliberative dictatorship. An emergent official ideology in China emphasizes Chinese traditions, incorporate Confucian values of meritocracy, hierarchy, public service, social order, and harmony, and is presented as a contrast to foreign liberalism liberal divisiveness in the, and individual egotism. This has been dubbed Mandarin rule without an emperor. In addition, nationalism is cultivated as a powerful source of mobilization. In recent years, China has stepped up its uh, rhetoric against, the, against and domestic re repression of what it, it defines as the infiltration of Western values. Whether this will turn out to be a rearguard rear action in an ultimately futile struggle or something more ominous, only the future will tell. Critic argues that capitalist uh, authoritarianism has no universal message to offer the world, nothing attractive uh, to sell that people can aspire to, and hence no, so no soft power for winning hearts and minds. But there is a flip side to the universalist coin. Many around the world find liberal universalism dogmatic, intrusive, and oppressive. 
Resistance to a unipolar world concerns not only American power, but also the hegemony of human rights uh, liberalism. There is a deep and widespread aversion in non-Western societies to being lectured by the West. Contrary to perceptions in the West, uh, liberal democracy is not merely a neutral mechanism for choosing between values. It is in, it's, uh, itself an ideological choice incorporating a whole set of values that many societies and cultures I find uh, to be deeply in, deeply in conflict with other values that cher they cherish more dearly. Throughout East and Southeast Asia, for example, the world's fastest developing and most populous region, there is a, a widely voiced public sentiment in favor of traditional Asian values promoted against Western cultural imperialism and emphasizing group values, social harmony, <coughs> and hierarchy. While cultural and social values are not immute, immutable, nor are they inconsequential superstructures. A message need not necessarily be formulated in universalistic terms to have a broader appeal. <coughs> Fascism during the 1920s and 30s was a very pa particularistic creed. It was nas nationalistic, based on my country. Still, it had a lot of dev uh, devotees and people who imitated it outside Italy, Germany, and Japan. Everybody applied it to, to their own particular country and society. Indeed, East and Southeast Asia are not alone in their ambivalence toward Western liberalism and potential attraction to alternative models of modernity. Latin America, Central Asia, the Middle East, and Africa may be particularly susceptible to the capitalist uh, non-democratic model. In many of these regions, Chinese economic involvement by way of trade, investment, and development has been mm -hmm. booming, and it comes with no strings attached, no request to reform uh, the domestic system, and no humanitarian criteria to meet. Skepticism regarding the sustainability of Russia's uh, <coughs> oligarchic and uh, kleptomanic capitalism is the most wanted. Putin's Russia has captured the headline with its invasion and, ex and annexation of, the, of uh, the Crimea, militarized involvement in the Ukraine and Syria, and growing antagonism with the West. However, Russia's surge under Putin has been built on the bonanza in the price of oil and gas during the uh, uh, 2000, uh, 2000s, which is, which is economically limited and limiting, and has, and has now subsided. Despite its new assertiveness, liberalism, uh, liberalization, no. Yeah, I have, uh, yeah, sorry about that. <coughs> Russia remains a pook and on the whole weak country and is unlikely to, bro to break through the rank, break through to the rank of the advanced economies unless it is able to revive its manufacturing sector building on its educated uh, workforce. On the other side, things in the liberal democracies are, less, are far less brilliant than they used to be. Before the outbreak of the Great Recession in 2007-8, when the capitalist democratic model was still at the apex of its prestige, practically nobody suspected that triumphalism was soon to be replaced by a profound crisis and deep malaise. It, just, it was purely uh, hypothetical for one to suggest at the time that even in its current bastions in the West, the liberal political economic consensus may be vulnerable to the effect of a lingering economic recession. It was somewhat less speculative to suggest that liberal Europe may become vulnerable to a resurgence of ethnic strife and deeply concerned by non-integrating immigrant communities. One further, su one further suggested at the time that if the hegemonic core was, was to be, were to be shaken, the effect might be even greater in other parts of the world where in adherence to liberalism and democracy was, was, was either non-existent or more recent, incomplete, and insecure. In the meantime, the world has experienced the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Indeed, analogies to the 1930s when fascism and communism, uh, when fascist and communist totalitarianism draw, uh, strove on the apparent failure of, the capi of capitalist democracies are inescapable. One hopes that the current economic crisis will not be nearly as 
catastrophic, poli catastrophic politically. And yet the hegemonic model's loss of much of its aura, as in the dra dramatic reversal in the image of the European Union within one decade, from the paradigm of the future to a deeply problematic and dysfunctional, dysfunctional basket case, has left a strong impression. The more dysfunctional and crisis-ridden the liberal democratic countries appear, the greater the, greater the self-confidence and global allure of state-driven and nationalistic capitalist authoritarianism. Illiberal popular parties that became marginal in Europe after 1945 are staging a comeback on the continent and outside it. While not reversing the third wave of democratic ex expansion has stalled since the beginning of the century, Ten years ago, more accurately, and in some respects, there's been a regression um, and uh, prompting uh, talk comments about uh, authoritarian resurgence. This is not to argue that the authoritarian regime fare better. Both the massive challenges that China faces and its huge and yet unfulfilled potential should be reckoned with, both of them. As China gradually exhausts its reservoir of cheap labor, uh, rural labor, the country's hectic growth is slowing down. With its low birth rate, China's population is aging fast. The abilities of China's regime to fight corruption, retain domestic legitimacy when setbacks and crises inevit inevitably occur after a long period of economic growth, and withstand pressure to embrace political uh, liberalization and democratization, all of these questions, questions remain open. All the same. With a low to medium GDP per capita of around $7,000, um, and as we remember the steep past trajectories of earlier East Asian tigers, China is likely to become much richer and more powerful with every decade. Whether or not China will eventually undergo political liberalization and democratization is probably the most intriguing question of the 21st century. Furthermore, might China democratize along a different path, espousing a populist nationalist creed and become what has been dubbed as illiberal democracy? Finally, even if uh, the peaceful scenarios eventually materialize, what major convulsions, including militarized confrontation, uh, may shake the world before the process finds its course? All these, again, are open questions that at present can only be regarded as thought experiments. The United States is the most vital factor on the other side of the equation, and the comparison between the consequences of uh, the 1929 and 2008 crisis is of particular importance. Having been, having been the world's only superpower and a widely envied model of success during the 1920s, the United States was dealt a crushing blow by the Great Depression. It withdrew inwardly, leaving the scene open to the Axis advance. At present, the United States is struggling with isolationist tendencies fueled by a number of costly and messy foreign entanglements. At the same time, American might, unrivaled during the brief <coughs> unipolar moment in the 1990s, is widely expected to undergo relatively, relative decline. On balance, however, the United States remains the indispensable nation in the 21st century as it was in the 20th century for the cause of, world, of a world order which is both politically and economically liberal. If not guaranteeing the victory of the liberal order, the United States is the main buttress against its decline and even destruction. It is primarily in this crucial sense that American exceptionalism is more exceptional than that of any other country. I'm not a prophet, and I do not pretend to predict whether or not China would eventually democratize and Russia reverse its retreat from democracy. What I suggest is a different reading of the reasons for the victory of democracy in the 20th century and the claim that the democratization of major actors such as China and Russia, and hence the face of the future, are far, for, are far from being preordained. 21st century international relations might be dominated by the existence of different and possibly opposing systems. The near total dominance of liberal democracy since the Soviet Union collapse 
uh, could be short-lived and a universal democratic peace may still be far off. I am afraid that the future is unlikely to be boring after all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Gard, just as well as Professor Gero, very concise on time. Thank you very much for that. So I have one comment, two comments so far. OK, let's start with you two. Thank you. Uh, my comment is actually both. Thank you. Uh, my comments actually to both last uh, presentations. Uh, now, thinking uh, uh, of uh, uh, the way of the girl strategy now develops, uh, actually, if you have less than one billion people, you are going to fall to the wayside. Uh, now, China is already running fast. Uh, India is following fast. There is coming up a big Africa. And it, my argument is that Russia belongs to Europe. There is no other place for Russia to go. Russia cannot be looked upon as a country of the future, except as part of a, a renewed European Union. Now, globalization has done a lot. But globalization is not only in terms of economics, but also in terms of problems. Uh, global warming, sustainability are things that are real and are going to drive the way how the 21st century is going to look. Uh, China is ahead in combating climate change, despite everything else that is being said about China. Uh, the Indians are working in that direction. Europe is trying to, but the individual countries in Europe are too small in order to be any power in this context. So really, I would like to see a different way of looking at the globe. Thank you. And could you pass it on to the far left from my side, from my point of view? Could you pass the microphone over there? Yes. yet I'll come to the microphone right. so uh, I, I was pleased to hear more of the uh, economic discussion this afternoon in the afternoon session but um, still a bit frustrated and I just want to leave uh, I'm, I'm not expecting answers but I'll leave three uh, just three brief questions um, is the crisis in democracy that people are talking about global if not how is it concentrated how do we measure how it's concentrated uh, is there some correlation between that number two does it matter um, you, you, you began to come close to this, but does it matter if the uh, mature democracies, as an average over the long term, are growing at 5% growth long term, 2.5% growth, or 1% growth? Is that, does it matter but long term? Um, this week on Thursday, the leaders of the seven industrial countries will come together and um, it's an unknown, not very well known, but in fact, uh, growth, long-term growth among the seven countries is the lowest it's been since the meetings began 42 years ago. And to your point, in 2010, the amount of economic activity happening outside the G7 is greater than what was happening inside. That seems to, um, taken your, your arguments, it seems to be pretty important in terms of how you see the next set. And the third question is that it appears, we've been dancing around this all day, that global influences, or let's call them external influences, strong external influences, have been overwhelming domestic political institutions. Yeah? I mean, I think that's really how we kind of can summarize globalization. How, how important has this phenomenon been to this discussion of the erosion in democracy? There's been really no discussion of that. Thank you very much. One more comment behind you. Yeah, Claire, I wanted to ask a little from a different angle, but in this direction. I think there is an imbalance between our discussion of globalization, monetary globalization, and there is like a backlog of our 
discussions about values. That means if we say that democracy, which democracy is, of course, a universal system, and I thank you for your wonderful presentation. On the other hand, it is so that we see that China can become a global partner, also politically correct, although their, their democratic system is, is not so, let's say, not so good. Is that, is that the result of neoliberalism, neoliberal capitalist economy, or that means the whole imbalance, which of course threatens world peace, et cetera, et cetera, or are we in a cultural crisis that we have on the one hand developed globalization, technological uh, revolutions, and the industrial revolution somehow we managed, but we haven't at all managed glob global uh, revolution, and, uh, and, uh, and this imbalance of a system, now I'm talking about a system, which is compatible. We have media that are compatible, but we don't have value systems that are compatible. So I would like to ask the question, is there a way of adaptation? Is there compat compatibility? And we knew this about if you have windows or something else. And uh, what, uh, is there a way of helping with that? Of solving that problem. Right, Professor Gavison, can you wait for the microphone? I want to add just one question to your picture. I'm very glad that you extended the looking at the future of democracy to the world. I think this is very, very important. I would like to introduce a structural problem of democracy that we haven't really talked about, and this is the length of the horizon. Because some of the reasons to, to prefer non-democracy to democracy is built on the idea that in all democratic regimes, uh, there is a time span after which you need to go back to the voter. And it may be longer or shorter, but since it's natural that you do need in order to uh, successfully implement any long-term policy, be re-elected, then you spend a lot of your energy and resources on being re-elected, which means that you are becoming more populistic because you need to, every one year, two years, four years, whatever, be re-elected, which calls for something else than promising long-term. So there is a structural problem in all democracies that democratic authorities, unlike technocratic, non-electable uh, they must be governed to it in at least some extent by short-term and very short-term uh, uh, goals. Now, I think that we all agree that with the kind of challenges we are facing with climate and other things, this short-term horizon is, is critical. It's devastating. So the ability of a leader to be a long-term thinker, a strategic thinker, is the potential for corruption, exploitation, domination, and whatever, but it may also be a condition that is necessary for a healthy, continual understanding of long-term risks and effectively dealing with them. And I wonder whether the traditional uh, countries that are more authoritarian, that has not, have not gone through the idea of individualization, of being in a non-mediated contact to individuals, but rather maintaining some sense of community that has a longer term interest. And I wonder, but in our region, it is said that republics are much more vulnerable than uh, um, uh, uh, monarchies. And monarchies are more viable because they have legitimacy systems that are not dependent on elections. Burke said this was one of the main reasons for stability of England, that it was not electing its government. Now, I wonder if we don't want to think about reintroducing some, some, some balance between elected and non-elected features in 
all government. We, we have them. We have them, but so I, I would like to hear more about the okay. possible structural innovations within democracy that will give us more of a non-electable, electable modes of accountability that might, uh, I think, improve the effectiveness of democracies because I agree that they now stand a, a, a fiercer challenge than they had in the past. Thank you very much. Like, like my predecessors, I assume that I have one hour now to respond to the questions. I, I thought what, that my uh, presentation was broad enough, but apparently it wasn't broad enough. <laughs> it needs to be broadened. So I don't know. I'll, I'll just make a few comments. I'm not an economist, but uh, is the, is the, uh, is the global, is the, are the democracies facing a global uh, crisis? Apparently they do. Is it for <laughs> global reasons or perhaps you know because of the economic crisis that we have which is a global uh, phenomenon so all of them are affected naturally is it because of uh, fundamental structural problems which are not particular to the, the democracies but are also felt by democracies so for example aging population population that we saw first in, in Japan and it, now we feel, the, we feel the effects of it uh, throughout the, the West and not only the West, also the East. Uh, so these are not problems that uh, are particular to, to the democracies but are felt by the democracies. So perhaps the general feeling of, uh, of, uh, of crisis is uh, not uh, directly attributed to the function of the democratic institutions themselves or the system but rather to external uh, causes that are <coughs> affecting here, maybe, uh, difficult to say, but uh, obviously there is a role, I mean, obviously the economic crisis plays a role and other things. Uh, with, with, with respect to the uh, rate of economic growth, uh, I don't think, well, the, I, the question is not actually about democracies, as you asked, but about, not about mature democracies, but about mature economies. You are asking whether the, the fact that, my, that the most developed economies uh, have a growth rate now which is, uh, which is slower than the historical rate, though the historical range is something tricky because the, the highest rate was just after World War, in the decades after World War II when, when the destruction in Europe was such that, you know, growth rates were, were very fast, and obviously the United States uh, also uh, benefited from that, though to a, a, a lesser level. So, um, so we have in the developed economy a slower rate of growth than we have in the less developed economies, which is natural because they have, uh, they have more, t they can catch up, so they can uh, leap frog, as they say, uh, and, 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 and so we see, we see in some of the de successful developing uh, economies, such as uh, China for several decades, and also in, uh, now in India, we saw a growth rate that even after the, its uh, slowdown in uh, China, it's still three times um, uh, faster than, than that of the United States and uh, certainly of uh, the countries of Europe and the same applies to India. Uh, so it's natural that this should be the case. My point is obviously that it's going to affect the balance of world power since, since they are likely to grow faster than the democracies. I mean, India obviously is a democracy, but since, say, China is likely despite all its uh, problem, and I'm, I'm sure that it's <laughs> going to have its uh, measure of crisis and, uh, and uh, upheaval and so forth during its uh, long um, march towards uh, modernity, but since its uh, rate of growth is likely to be faster than that of the more mature economies, we are going to see, as I said, China uh, growing uh, in, in terms of uh, both wealth and power with every decade, uh, maybe less steeply so than, uh, than before, but still this uh, is likely to remain the case. Uh, yes, the, um, at present the um, <coughs> democracies in China do not share a regime that is one is democratic and the other is not democratic one is liberal the other is non-liberal but they share uh, economic liberalism 
And uh, this includes an open trade system. Now, j j normally, and I think uh, in 80% or uh, majority of cases, this uh, correlates with, uh, with pacificity, with lesser war. It was during the 1930s when the world embraced protectionism mm -hmm. that some of the countries, like Germany, like uh, Japan, felt that they had to, to have their own Lebensraum, or, mm -hmm. or, or the, as the Japanese call it, East Asian uh, co-prosperity sphere. If you do not let us trade, and you close your domain, and you say you have your empires, but these empires are, you know, came to us uh, in past history, and now the others are not allowed to have them, so that's unfair, and uh, if you, we are not uh, allowed to trade across political boundaries, so we shall create the political boundaries which we, will allow us to prosper. So at present, oh, I mean generally, and generally it's obviously true that liberalism <coughs> is in, in trade, that is economic liberalism is a force for peace. There is a snag here because if, say, uh, liberal, if, say, countries that are developing uh, participate in the liberal economic order, thereby gaining in wealth and in power, and eventually turn this newly gained wealth and power against the system, as happened, for example, with Germany, so that that won't be so good. That would mean that we are feeding the lion that, or the tiger that is going to bite us. So at present, this is what I have to contribute. Now, regarding the, uh, regarding the, um, the problem of uh, short-termism in, uh, in, um, in the democracies, now again, this is a problem that uh, is old as, uh, as political philosophy. I think uh, it was raised first by Plato, who, uh, who asked uh, how the demos is more qualified to decide on political issues than the experts. So we have uh, and, and all the whims of, of the electorate and so forth. And this is obviously the case also made by, by the current rulers of China. They represent the, uh, the common good, uh, the, uh, the general will and they uh, promised to, be, to bring this good uh, to China as opposed to the whims and uh, untrustworthiness of the electorate. Uh, whether or not it's, uh, I mean, we have uh, two and a half uh, thousand years of experience and obviously there are some arguments and, and that here and there. On the whole, the balance is in f more in favor of liberal democracy, but that might be tentative. Uh, all regimes have uh, structural weaknesses, and the, the question is uh, what weaknesses uh, count more. Uh, the uh, Chinese authorities are not o uh, obligated to, to be elected, but that carries its own uh, perils, including legitimacy, including uh, the question of corruption, and so forth, including the problem of changing course, and, uh, and so forth. So. Uh, We'll have to wait and see, I guess. That's what it'll do. Okay, thank you very much thank so you. far.